Hey, everybody, it is Trags Mike Petralia, rested and relaxed after a 4th of July break. I am ready to resume and get ready. Look ahead to 2024 Bengals training camp. This is the Jungle Roar podcast, and I think it's appropriate that I have the one and only Dan Horde, of course, the voice of the Cincinnati Bengals on the Bengals radio network. I have him on this podcast. Why is that, you ask? Well, that is because you may notice around me, new studios. I have moved. And in the very first podcast in the old studio, who was it? Dan Horde back in 2021. Well, it's appropriate. Dan Horde is the first podcast guest. Of course, I host the Code Reds podcast. Haven't had that yet in the studio, but uh, first Jungle War podcast in the brand new studio, brand new home. Dan Horde, welcome. It is an honor to have you. Trags, it's always great to be on the pod. Now, I'm looking at the painting behind you. I'm getting kind of a Venice vibe. I don't know it exactly. Is. It's Venice? It is indeed, uh, okay. Dan. It's Venice. Uh, the previous owners of uh, said house uh, had a Mediterranean feel in the room that I'm in. It is going to be modified. No slight to the previous owners, mind yeah. you. Okay, they, but they let you keep the art. They did well. They gave us two things. The lovely Deborah Ann has a spirit animal, and that is a giraffe. So they gave us a giraffe when we entered the new home, nice. and they let us have this painting behind us in the office, which will be turned into the Trags podcast office soon enough. But we had to get the podcast on the air to fulfill commercial commitments, as I'm sure you're more than aware of. And uh, we want to get right into it, uh, Dan. And I want to talk about a podcast that you just had with the NFL Network's Adam Rank. It's fascinating whenever one of these national experts or national observers, writers, what have you, give their perception of the Cincinnati Bengals. What did Adam Rank have to say? Where did he rank the Bengals in terms of the overall state of the franchise with regard to the 31 other teams? I've got a siren in the background here. Am I Quite all there? right. I, maybe that's appropriate for uh, what Adam Rank had to say. Go well, ahead. what Adam, Adam Rank had to say is that for the Bengals season to be considered a success, they must win the Super Bowl. So he is setting the bar extremely high for the Bengals. He thinks they're worthy of that status. And furthermore, as he wrote these state of the franchise stories about all 32 NFL teams, they always end with that category. What must the team do for the upcoming season to be a success? And in the AFC North, both the Bengals and the Ravens must win the Super Bowl for the season to be a success. And for the Browns and Steelers, they must have a significant playoff run. So that tells you what Adam Rank from NFL Network thinks of the AFC North. He said it's without question the toughest division in the NFL. And he said, furthermore, it wouldn't shock him if any of the four teams made it to the Super Bowl. So while he does have Baltimore and Cincinnati a notch above Cleveland and Pittsburgh, he thinks the Browns and Steelers are just that far behind uh, Cincinnati and Baltimore. It's great to have those expectations. That's what Joe Burrow talked about when he first came to Cincinnati in 2020 and had the initial success in 2021. He said, obviously, the famous words, this is the new standard. This is what we expect every single year and you know so far so good the Bengals have set the standard they have yet to achieve the goal look everybody and their brother knows that the most important facet of the offseason is the healing of Joe Burrow's right wrist we did see him throw some footballs varying levels of stress and strain and authority behind those throws in the offseason what were your biggest takeaways Trags, I did not see a discernible difference. Now, I was not there for the very first practice that the media was allowed to watch. And I understand from reading people like you and James Rapine and Paul Daner Jr., et cetera, that maybe in that very first practice, some of the passes wobbled a little bit and didn't quite look like vintage Burrow. But from the second practice on, the ones that I attended, I didn't really see a difference. So I think he's going to be fine. My concern for Joe Burrow is a little bit different, I think, from everybody else or at least many other people. I'm not worried about his wrist. I'm worried about his other body parts 
if he adjusts anything because of his wrist, hmm. which yeah. we see all the time in every type of sport. A runner has a, a bad ankle. The next thing you know, they've got a hamstring strain because they're doing something just a tiny bit different yep. to uh, account for the bad ankle. That's my concern with Joe. Now, his mechanics are so great that hopefully it's not a problem. But I do have just a tiny concern that because of the wrist, maybe the shoulder starts to hurt a little bit because yeah, he's that's... making some sort of minute change. So again, this is not something that consumes me. I'm not panicked over that possibility. But it's one thing I've got in the back of my mind that hopefully the mechanics are such that he doesn't tweak anything just a tiny bit because he's coming back from the wrist injury. I think he's smart enough, and this is what I think he has acknowledged he's learned over his first four years in the NFL, is listen to your body, back off when you need to back off. And we saw him back off toward the end of OTAs into minicamp. And, you know, there was some concern at the start of minicamp his first day, well, we, when we saw him. He was throwing very lightly. He wasn't putting a lot of force behind the throws, and he said that was intentional. Um, he wants to, you know, throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball as much as possible. But when it starts to get sore or whatnot, listen, back off, and then, you know, I think he went in pretty, I think, relaxed into the uh, summer break after the mini camp, and I think he was in a good place. I agree. I'm happy to see that he got away from football. That's not always easy for him. So the trip to Cannes, the subsequent trip to Paris, the fashion show with the backless jacket, which might be the worst look I've ever seen, but Joe is so handsome that he managed to pull it off. I'm glad to see he got away from football. Now I'm sure yeah. he's locked in again. Uh, I imagine there has probably been a throwing session or there's going to be a throwing session with some of his guys before training camp begins. And, uh, I have no doubt he'll be ready to go. And I do think during the course of training camp, there will probably be periods where he backs off a little bit or the training staff and coaching staff mandates that he stay and backs off a little bit. And that's all a good thing. Let's, let's try to get him through training camp healthy for a change and yep. be ready to go 100% for the start of the season. That was the biggest thing I think I noticed, Dan, uh, this offseason with Joe Burrow. We heard a couple of years ago, and I remember this famously, he said J J late June and July is not a time to get away. It's not a time to just un, you know, uh, completely disconnect. It's a time to relax, but keep your focus. I think he's changed that approach a little bit in his trips, like you said, to Cannes, to Paris, uh, the Tom Brady par white party. Uh, I think that's an indication that, hey, you can get away, you can relax your brain uh, without having to stay local. I will quote Marvin Lewis here and say that I see better than I hear. So when he would say things in the past about backing off, did he ever really do it? Probably not. Well, mm -hmm. now we can see that he has in this case. Now, I will say I had the opportunity to play golf with his dad right around the time that that Paris fashion show was winding down. Joe made a point of like catching an earlier flight back in order to be working out with teammates the next Monday when he didn't have to do that. So I, I guess his, uh, you know, unwinding period is different from some. He wanted to make sure he was in the gym first thing that next Monday morning when he knew guys were going to be there. But uh, again, it was good, in my opinion, to see him truly get away from football for a while. And he did not bring his trainer to France, which is unusual hmm. for Joe. Typically when he travels, the trainer goes with. That was not the case on uh, his European adventure. See, that, that's why we have Dan Horde, Voice of Bengals, on this Jungle Roar podcast, because you bring nuggets like that, which are very pertinent and apropos. So thank you for pointing that out. Mike Petralia Trags here. One of my very favorite summertime experiences happened 15 years ago when I took my two daughters, Janie and Emma, to their first Cincinnati Reds baseball game. It wasn't so much the game on the field that they were that interested in. It was bugging good old dad to take them to the concession stand for that hot dog and yes, that soda. Maybe watch the game a little bit here and there, but really it was all about the experience of taking in a baseball game. 
Well, now through game time, you can take your family to a baseball game and enjoy that very same experience. With the Game Time app, there are last minute tickets, flash deals, and zone deals. Easy to find and buy MLB tickets for every kind of event in your area. There's views from all seats in the venue, and there's a lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, and job loss protection as well. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, making getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code CLNS for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Uh, with Dan Horn of the Bengals uh, Radio Network. Dan, uh, of the rookies you've seen so far, drafted and undrafted for that matter, but primarily drafted, who has stuck out? I would say Jermaine Burton, partly because of what they've done so far. So in the OTAs and minicamp, it's really not football. I mean, yeah. there's a little bit of offense and defense standing on the field at the same time, but there's not much contact. There's obviously no hitting or tackling. There's not much of that in training camp nowadays. So to evaluate any of these guys based on that stuff is hard to do, but at least in Jermaine Burton's case, we saw him run. We saw him catch. We saw how fluid he is on the field. Uh, none of that is unexpected after seeing his college highlights and reading about him after the Bengals have made the pick. But to see that stuff in person does make an impression. And uh, uh, another really small thing that I've pointed out in some interviews, but I thought it was really cool, is that when the, the Bengals begin their practices uh, in these offseason programs, uh, Jermaine Burton would typically come out about 15 minutes early with another rookie wide receiver, Cole Burgess, and they would do about 15 minutes of drills with wide receivers coach Troy Walters before the other guys even migrated their way from the locker room out to the practice fields. Well, as this was going on, Jermaine Burton would always have out of the corner of his eye. Uh, he'd be looking off toward the kind of the walkway where the guys would approach from the locker room. And as soon as he saw Joe Burrow come out with the other three quarterbacks just to begin playing catch before right. the team would do its uh, organized stretch, at that point, Jermaine was, would stop doing what he's doing and make sure that he caught every one of Joe Burrow's warm-up tosses. Now, is that a big deal? Probably not. But I still think it, it sends shows, a message. I, I, it I sends like a message. It shows some savvy from a rookie. They're yep. building trust. He's getting comfortable with the way those throws feel. And he's he's really pointing out to Joe Burrow. Listen, I want to be one of your most important guys. And if T Higgins and Jamar Chase are not here during this time period, then I want to be the guy that catches every ball I can possibly catch. Hopefully that bodes well going forward. Do you think there's a, some prove it, earn it, show me from Joe Burrow regarding Jermaine Burton? Like meaning um, we're not going to just say you're very talented. The tape shows that your accomplishments at Alabama show that. But you've got to prove it here at the NFL stage. You got to prove it to me. You got to prove it to Troy Walters. You got to prove it to the whole coaching staff, Zach, et cetera. Do you think there's some of that? Because I think there is. There is, but I don't think it's specific to Jermaine Burton. I think that's true of every newcomer. So even a veteran like Mike Gasicki, Joe Burrow is basically saying, All right, let's see what you got. Let's see how it fits. Have you learned our offense? Do you know where you should be on this particular play? And once they build that trust, then, you know, you're one of Joe Burrow's guys. Trenton Irwin is the perfect example. He's built that trust whenever mm. he's needed. Yep. Joe Burrow has the total confidence that Trenton Irwin is going to step in and get the job done. And, and that's why I think Trenton Irwin probably doesn't have to worry about having a spot on the roster this year. I'm fascinated to see how Chase Brown and Zach Moss turn out in the Bengals' backfield. I think, you know, the the understanding, I think the presumption is, Dan, that Chase Brown's going to get a lot more, a bigger role and a lot more carries this year. Do you see that as being the case? And what is the role for Zach Moss? 
Well, I do see that being the case for Chase Brown. Now, that's not saying much. He barely got the ball until the end of last season, and when he got it, he did good things with it. So I'm sure he's going to play a much bigger role. Trags, have you been watching, I guess there's only been one episode so far, but the off-season version of Hard Knocks with the New York Giants? I have not. Okay. So the first episode came out last week, and it focuses largely on their general manager, Joe Shane and, you know, the process that he's going through in the early portion of the off season leading up to the combine, uh, what players they will consider in free agency. Do they need to franchise tag Saquon Barkley for a second time, et cetera. And I bring this up for this reason. They're going over the free agent running backs at that point that are available and they start with Zach Moss. And you hear the Giants front office talk about how they feel about Zach Moss before he signed with Cincinnati, and it's glowing. They refer to him as the best third down blitz pickup running back, maybe in the NFL, not only in the free agent class, and about how he thrived Mm. last year when he got opportunities from the Indianapolis Colts. So I already felt good about the addition of Zach Moss. I feel even better after hearing a behind-the-scenes look from the New York Giants at how other teams felt about Zach Moss when he was available in free agency. I'm excited to see how Dan Pitcher uses the new weapons on the offense, how he integrates the new players. We haven't even, we've gone, let's see, what is it, 1507 into the podcast. I have not mentioned Jamar Chase, and I have not mentioned T. Higgins. I think that's a good sign, Dan. I'm excited about Dan Pitcher for this reason. To me, Dan Pitcher is Joe Burrow in terms of his personality. Brian Callahan, I love Brian Callahan. We all do. Nicest guy in the world. Makes friends quickly, super friendly with the media. I think he's got a chance to be an awesome NFL head coach. Dan Pitcher, though, has that Burrow tunnel vision. (laughs) I mean, he is locked in at all times, except maybe, you know, when he's home with his family. But when he's in the building, his focus is Burrow-like. And I don't know if the offense will look any different as a result. It probably won't look much different. Zach Taylor, after all, is still in charge. But I do think there might be an interesting, you know, relationship between Burrow and Dan Pitcher that's beneficial beneficial for the team. Okay, let's go back to the hard knocks uh, because it broke uh, during the course of the last couple of months uh, that uh, the AFC North North will be featured in a reworked, re-envisioned, if you will, uh, hard knocks. And that includes the entire AFC North. You already mentioned, Dan, and I think for good reason. It is regarded, Adam Rank mentioning this, uh, as the toughest division in the NFL with all four teams somewhat, I guess, having realistic Super Bowl expectations, some higher, Ravens and Bengals and others. Uh, But your thoughts on Hard Knocks going with the, the entire division, assuring that one of those teams, no question, will be in the playoffs. So this is the third year that Hard Knocks has had an in-season addition. It was the Cardinals two years ago and the Colts last year. I have not watched those in-season additions except for the occasional episode here and there where I kind of was, you know, flipping around. It was on, so I watched the rest. I have not made a commitment to watch them from beginning to end, but it always struck me as blatantly unfair for one team to have at least some secrets out there. Now the teams have the ability to say yay or nay to things that are in the episode. They can control it somewhat, but still you always learn something about those teams. And for one team during the season to have that stuff out there struck me as being really unfair in the past. So I think that's a big reason why the NFL and NFL films have decided to do this for an entire division. Now, there might still be some competitive disadvantages against the teams from outside your division in those final weeks of the season, but at least it's fair inside the division between the Ravens, Bengals, Steelers, and Browns. So in that sense, I think it was a good move. Obviously, we will now all be locked in to every second of these episodes uh, when they kick in in the second half of the season. So 
I'm looking forward to it. I'm guessing the Bengals front office and coaching staff isn't, uh, but that's the way it is. You do not have veto power anymore over a hard knocks in the NFL. This is the Jungle War podcast powered by our friends at Prize Picks and the Game Time app. Back with Dan Horde here. Uh, Dan Horde, the voice of the Bengals, of course. Uh, mentioned Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. And T. Higgins uh, has been a big storyline in the offseason, obviously. And what, what did you make, Dan, of him signing the franchise tag when he did as opposed, same agent, we know this, David Mulligata of athletes first signing the franchise tag at the end of minicamp as opposed to jesse bates who didn't really sign i think until three weeks into preseason or two two and a half weeks into preseason in 2022 i think jesse was right after the final preseason game so two weeks after the or two weeks before the regular season began it's good it means that t's going to be there for training camp i think that's obviously good for the team I think it's good for T if T wants to get the kind of contract that he thinks he deserves and a healthy T Higgins does deserve it, then he needs to have a good year. Um, I think he will. The T Higgins storyline has always been obvious in Cincinnati and a mystery apparently to the rest of the world. I mean, we would see these stories on NFL.com or whatever website you like to look at. Will the Bengals trade T Higgins? Will T Higgins be a no show? Will T Higgins hold out? That None of that was ever going to happen. They weren't going to trade him. He wasn't going to hold out. We knew he was going to play on the, probably on the franchise tag this year. So it's never been a question of whether they were going to have T Higgins or not. And, uh, you know, getting back to what you started with, I think it's good that there's not going to be drama going into a training camp about when he's going to be there. He signed the tag. He's going to be there, and he's going to be a huge part of this offense. Trags here. I want to tell you about Prize Picks, America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps, on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you have to do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the daily action with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. Imagine turning 10 bucks into $1,000 almost instantly. And if you're looking for promotions, Prize Picks has got you covered every week. From lowering select players' stats projections on Tuesdays to help your lineup hit, or getting your entry fees back if you have a losing lineup on Fridays. It's fun, it's simple, it's easy. Three things that are a slam dunk for me. Speaking of slam dunk, I won recently playing Caitlin Clark for more than three and a half three-pointers made and Brianna Stewart going for more than 23 points. Download the Prize Picks apps today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code CLNS on Prize Picks for a deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And Jamar. Jamar showing up at minicamp. Obviously, it's mandatory. He didn't want to get penalized, so he shows up and was a part of the meetings and whatnot. But he was more of a coach, Dan. I mean, he didn't really he didn't participate in the formal team periods whatsoever in minicamp. What do you make of that? Nothing. Uh, does anybody have any concern over Jamar Chase? Being Jamar no. Chase and one of the top wide receivers in the NFL, especially with a healthy Joe Burrow, no. So for him to uh, not actively practice for a few days in June, I could care less. He's going to be there when it matters, and uh, he's going to be one of the best players in the NFL. Something else uh, we have not touched on, Dax Hill. And he's going to be obviously a huge storyline going into training camp. The battle with DJ Turner. I think, and this is just my observation, I think DJ Turner has a step, no pun intended, a step ahead or a step up on him uh, in the battle for that other corner, uh, starting corner spot uh, opposite Cam Taylor-Britt. Your thoughts? 
My thought is that cornerback is the biggest question mark on the roster. I know after DJ Reader left, a lot of people point toward the interior defensive line, but I think between signing Sheldon Rankins and drafting the two guys they took in the first three rounds, they're going to be okay there. I do wonder about the cornerback position. I like the guys that they have, but Cam Taylor Britt missed much of last season, so we're basing our confidence in him being the number one corner on a limited sample size. DJ Turner started off extremely well, tapered off as his rookie year went on. That's not unusual for rookies, especially at that position, but still, it's a bit of a question mark as a result. Dax Hill has not played outside corner outside of one game. He's got the traits, but we've got to see it before we can feel confident about it. Uh, Josh Newton was awesome two years ago at TCU, not quite as good last year. I liked what I saw out of him at, at OTAs and minicamp, but again, he's a rookie. We haven't seen it. So if there's any position on the roster where I would say the Bengals still might want to consider bringing in a veteran, even if it's a guy who's you know, past his prime, but might have a little bit left in the tank, that would be the position I would consider. But sometimes they go to training camp, see how things are looking before they make one of those commitments. And it kind of feels like that's what they're going to do this time around. Xavier Howard still out there? He is. And he, and Lou Anarumo obviously coached him with the Miami Dolphins earlier in his career. That a kind of guy you're talking about? That that's maybe yeah, better. that's the kind of guy I'm talking about. I've specifically brought him up before on my podcast. Now his play has really declined over the last few years. Lou is going to be able to evaluate that better than anybody because he saw and coached Xavier Howard at his very best. But yeah, a guy like that who has been really good in the past. Patrick Peterson, I think, is still out there. Another possibility. Now, we don't know what these guys are asking for. It might be prohibitive, and maybe that makes it impossible. But there are still several guys that kind of fit that description out there, guys that used to be really, really good, and maybe they could still be good enough in a supporting role, backup role, mentor role uh, on this roster. We'll see. I think they hit a grand slam bringing back Von Bell and signing Geno Stone. You? Yeah, I uh, totally agree with that. I mean, Geno Stone might not be as good as he was last year. I think the ball found him a few times and helped him with that uh, high interception total for the Baltimore Ravens. But he's a proven player, a really good player. I think he's going to be solid. And we obviously know all about Von Bell, not only what he means on the field, but what he means in the locker room. I would agree with that. You're off to cover Big 12 Media Day, and I'm curious. Uh, we can talk a little bit, a little bit of the Bearcats. Scott Satterfield, um, your your thoughts on what the Bearcats have to do to take that next step? I'm not talking about winning the Big 12 or the Big 12 conference or getting to the conference title game. I'm just talking about being a relative team, uh, a relevant team, I should say, uh, in a conference that is as visible as any in the country? I think the next logical step is a winning season and a bowl appearance. And I think that's very attainable this year. They won three games last year. They had a bunch of losses by less than eight points. So, you know, single possession type games. They're better at quarterback. They weeded out some guys that they thought were not, you know, all pulling the rope together. So I think that's positive. They've had an exceptional off season under their strength and conditioning team. So I think winning season bowl game is the next logical step. I think starting fast is really important. You know, they're going to beat Towson in week one. I think we can uh, all kind of put that down as a given. That's a scrimmage, just essentially get ready for the season. Yeah, which told. most college teams do. So yeah. that's fine. Pitt at home in week two looms is an important game. They beat Pitt on the road last year. So you'd like to think if you can beat them on the road, you can beat them at Nippert. Miami in week three in Oxford, revenge game after seeing the, the victory bell street come to an end last year. And then their conference opener at home against Houston, another team that they beat on the road last year. So you'd like to think you can beat them at home. That's the recipe for a 4-0 and start. I'm not saying it's easy to go 4-0, and but the way I just outlined it, you can certainly see that there's an opportunity to be 4-0 and there. 
if you do that, you need two or three wins the rest of the year in Big 12 play to get to a bowl game, which is very attainable. If you look at the preseason media poll for the Big 12 that came out last week, Cincinnati only plays one of the teams picked to finish in the top five. Kansas Hmm. State was picked to finish second. Kansas State is on Cincinnati's schedule. The other four teams selected to finish in the top five are not teams that UC faces, at least in the regular season. So they've got a lot of games against the middle of the pack, a couple of games against the bottom of the pack, including Houston, a team that I mentioned earlier. To me, I think six or seven wins is very attainable, and I think that's the next logical step. Dan Horde, voice of the Bearcats. Uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Dante Corleone. What kind of loss is that? He had uh, had the blood clot, I believe, in his lung. And yeah. uh, he is has been ruled out for the season indefinitely. Um, your thoughts on that and what kind of, not only on the field blow, but off the field. He is one of the most charismatic, sincere young men. And if you've ever had a chance to talk to him after a game or talk to him at practice, he is just so charismatic and, and so genuine. I love him. He's the best player on the team. He's one of the best players in the country. He could have got paid big time to transfer elsewhere. He's remained loyal to UC. So uh, the news that he's going to have to deal with this blood clot was heartbreaking for all of us that love Dante Corleone. But Trags, I do think he will play this year. Uh, I think the expectation is he's on blood thinners right now. Let's take care of the clot while that's going on. There can't be any sort of contact or, you know, hard physical strain. I think he can probably do some minor uh, aerobic exercise, but nothing too extensive. Uh, And then once that cycled through his system and they've cleared him going forward, then he can resume football activities. Thinking about him playing in week one, Might be a stretch. That's a pretty aggressive timeline for when this all occurred. But I do think he's going to play this season, and I do think he will be fine going forward. There have been many football players, including Trey Smith, the offensive lineman for the Kansas City Chiefs, who've gone through this, made a complete recovery, hasn't been a problem again. I hope and pray that's going to be the case for Dante Corleone. And again, I do think that he will play for Cincinnati this year. Well, that's encouraging news, and I'm glad I brought it up. Because, uh, you know, certainly, as I mentioned, and you mentioned, he's one of the most popular players uh, in the University of Cincinnati in recent memory of Cincinnati football. Uh, Anything else on your uh, plate as uh, the next three weeks uh, approach as we get ready for uh, training camp? Well, I've got some podcast duties in terms of work. So the Bengals Booth podcast, obviously for the Bengals, and the new Let's Rain podcast for UC that debuted a couple of weeks ago with an episode featuring Steve Logan. I hope people saw it and enjoyed it because I thought Steve was tremendous. So those are the big things on my uh, work schedule right now, along with some uh, speaking engagements. But honestly, Trags, you know I love golf. Yes, I do. My golf season ends basically on July 24th when training camp begins. So hopefully between now and then, I'll get to play several times. And I hope one of those rounds is with you because we have not been out to play yet this year. And we've got to get that done before camp. That sounds like a plan. And on that very encouraging, positive note, playful note, Uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. That has been the Jungle Roar podcast. I want to thank our great sponsors, and that would be Prize Picks and the Game Time app. Thank, of course, uh, the great people at CLNS Media who helped put this podcast on all the uh, terrific platforms out there available for those who download their podcast wherever it is available. Again, want to thank Dan Horde, voice of the Bengals and the Cincinnati Bearcats for joining me on this episode of the Jungle Roar podcast. Until next week, keep that jungle roaring.